You don't hear much about the Club Deros. That's because they are probably the most secretive bikey gang in Western Australia, if not Australia. They do their business like bikies used to, in the shadows. Cops don't even really know how many patched members there are. They were one of the original four gangs in WA, along with the Coffin Cheaters, Gypsy Jokers and God's Garbage. Been around since the 1970s, but it wasn't until 1998 that they made headlines in a sustained way. That was when one of their members, Kevin Woodhouse, who went by the nickname Mad Mick, defected to the Coffin Cheaters which caused something of a frightful hoo-ha in the underworld for the next year or so. Which you recounted in one of your bikey docos. That's right. Let's roll tape. When there's blood in the water, in they come. The search for Lisa intensified. It's about a young girl who was missing. What do you care about that slut for? She's got to be out here somewhere. Do you know how Lisa Gunn died? Yes, I do. That was part of Catching Lisa's Killer, Fear and Murder in Kalgoorlie, which examined the 1999 disappearance of 28-year-old Lisa Govan. The Club Dero's outlaw motorcycle gang had a starring role. Because the cops think they know what happened to her. Lisa was last seen outside the Dero's Kalgoorlie clubhouse on Boulder Road. That was around 7.30 in the morning on October 8, 1999. She'd been at the clubhouse partying with a half a dozen people, one of whom was this guy. Andrew Edhouse was known as the baby-faced bikey. Cops reckon he was a central player in the Cheetah's Dero war that was raging around the time Lisa went missing. They charged him with killing coffin cheater Mark Shabs Chabrier, trying to kill Mark's clubmate Big Mick Anderson, and trying to kill the bloke who started the hoo-ha in the first place, Mad Mick. Ed House beat every charge. He's just got off on a willful murder charge. He hasn't got off yet. That was his brother, also in the club, one of the few times we've ever heard a Darrow speak publicly. Prosecution case didn't stack up. The cops had a big problem. Club Darrow's bikies don't talk to police, even when they're being roughed up by the police, which is what happened, we are told, during Ed House's questioning. Detectives investigating the Govan case hit that same wall of silence. They know she was at the Boulder Road Clubhouse shortly before she vanished, and they know she went there after hooking up with Andrew Edhouse outside the Safari nightclub. You know the old saying, nothing good happens after midnight? Yeah, Yeah, well, especially so after 4am on Hannon Street. 24 years later, no body, no arrest, and now the cops have admitted no leads. Two generations of detectives have been unable to crack the Darrow's code of silence. They've hit a dead end and they're now sending the case files to the state coroner. So what happens now? Most likely a coronial inquest and we'll probably see members of the Club Darrow's outlaw motorcycle gang called as witnesses. And then they'll say... Absolutely nothing. And when they refuse to cooperate, the penalty will be a modest fine. Same thing happened 25 years ago when four God's Garbage bikies were hauled before the state coroner. They were in court to answer questions about what caused Quinnin up mother of three, Lynette K. Higgins, to take her own life. In her suicide note, she claimed she was gang raped in the club's management clubhouse. God's Garbage members Ronald John Blake, aka Moot, Christian John Bailey, aka Squeak, Ian Robert Dingwell, a.k.a. Dinger, and Roger Lloyd Vodanovich, a.k.a. Wog, were hauled before the coroner, handed $1,000 fines, then charged with perverting the course of justice, handed $4,000 fines. Mm, so it's unlikely that the Darrows will have loose lips. No, because Darrows with loose lips end up dead. If you join most bikey gangs, you can expect to be a nom for 6 to 12 months. The Darrows will vet you for two years before they let you wear their patch. And in that two-year period, you have to do some serious shit to prove you can be trusted. They are an old-school, dirty denim bikey gang that treats their code of silence with deadly seriousness. That's a heavy start to the week. It is. We should talk about the Matildas. (laughs) Better news. Every Australian was on the edge of their seats on Saturday as they watched this. Step up in the big moment, and it is Courtney Vine for the Matildas. Can she do it? One of the most exciting moments in professional sport in recent memory. Cue the party! Wild scenes in Brisbane, me engine! highest rating TV sporting event since this. This is a famous victory, a magnificent performance. And Barnaby Joyce was completely unaware because he was accidentally watching a repeat of a month old warm up match. <laughs> Did you see there was a penalty shootout like anyway. nothing we've seen in men's or no, women's soccer? There was no penalty shootout <laughs> in the one you watched? 
I had no. Australia just won one nil. I think it was a previous game. I, it, was the, it was pretty dodgy. Whatever was happening, I think it was pretty dodgy. Said the country pub he was at on Saturday had the wrong channel on. Seriously, how did nobody notice it was the wrong channel? How does nobody at the pub look at their phone and notice the internet's blowing up because of a penalty shootout that's not happening on their TV? <laughs> this is what's happening. Here we go. Second time. Drive it from there. That didn't stop Barnaby telling Sunrise that we shouldn't get a national holiday if the Matildas win the tournament. We've got to be really careful just uh, taking days off because ultimately somebody does pay. I mean, it's, it's not a case of it's for free. Somebody has to pay. God, I wish he had a code of silence. He's a politician, so no chance. I'm Ben Harvey. For more up late, click the subscribe button below.